was that in 1835, the proprietor of a well-known restaurant in Boston, William Fennell, was fishing one day in a boat off Swampscott Shore. He remarked as he passed by Phillips Point, which is now Galoops Point, that it would make a fine summer resort. Soon after, he bought 19 acres from William Farmer Phillips for $1,600. And on a rise commanding the Atlantic Ocean, he built the first ocean house. This was the first summer hotel on the mainland of the North Shore. Nahant did have a hotel, but it was not on the mainland, because Nahant was not on the mainland then. Keep in mind that except for the Phillips family homes and a few farmhouses, there were almost no dwellings along what we now know of as Puritan Road. There was nothing on the Loops Point, Littles Point, Pella Road, Gale Road. Uh, it was all clear land from there to Marblehead. Most of the homes in the community, and we couldn't call it a town because it wasn't a town then, but it was a community, they were centered around Humphrey Street, Blaney Street, King Street, and Rockland. And there were some fishing sheds at the beginning of Puritan Road. The coast road from the center of town to Marblehead had been a favorite summer fishing and hunting area for the Native Americans, and they continued to camp here in the summers into the early 1800s. We actually have a picture at the uh, Historical Society of uh, some Native Americans who were camping on Lincoln House Point. The bathhouses seen here were on wheels, and they were rolled down to the beach for changing purposes. William Fennell and the Eastern Railroad, which began construction in 1838, literally put Swampscott on the map. Remember that Swampscott was still a part of Lynn and did not become a town until 1852. Many of the guests that stayed at the Ocean House were so impressed with the area that they built their own summer estates here. Names such as Munch, who built his estate around what is now the Monument area, General Stetson, whose estate was what is now the county area, with streets named after counties like Norfolk and Middlesex and Hampton, and James L. Little, who built several family estates on what is now Little's Point. Other small inns were built to house the overflow of guests from the Ocean House. The first Ocean House burned down in 1864, and another Ocean House was built on Puritan Road across from Wales Beach. By this time, there were 16 summer hostelries in town, making it the leading resort of the day. This second ocean house also burned down in 1882. In, 18, in 1884, a firm owned by Ainsley and Grabeau built and opened a hotel on the same property, calling it the New Ocean House. And in 1902, extensive renovations totaling $100,000, think of that in 1902, were done. The structure was five stories high and 450 feet long, catering to an exclusive and wealthy clientele. We were lucky enough to get a brochure from those days. It was published by Ainsley and Rabot. And you will see the type of clientele that they were trying to attract when I read this. The new, this is a quote. The New Ocean House is now the largest and most select summer hotel on the New England shore, having accommodations for 400 people. There are over 100 private baths. Do the math. <laughs> and the hotel is lighted throughout with electricity. The brochure from the early 1900s shows pictures of the ladies' reception room, the gentlemen's writing room, the billiard hall, the foyer, the picture of the foyer had orientals, elegant wood paneling, and a stairway, and Tiffany-style lamps on the table, the sunroom, and the sitting porch, where, the brochure states, the passing show at certain hours almost equals that of the late afternoon parade on Upper Fifth Avenue. The brochure, the brochure continues. The patronage of the New Ocean House is exclusive and refined and will in every way meet the requirements of the most exacting people. A noted feature of life at the New Ocean House is the general tone of refinement that prevails among its many guests. It continues, with all the attractions of Massachusetts' unrivaled North Shore, 
including superb water views, unsurpassed bathing, safe sailing, and fishing, it has the unique added attractions of splendid foliage and trees, rural scenery, and quaint old shaded roads full of historic interest. Guests returned year after year, and many were listed and many listed the New Ocean House as their summer address, as can be seen in the Blue Book, which was the social register of the time. Interestingly enough, many of the winter addresses were Beacon Hill and Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, so they did not come from very far away at that early time. The brochure tells us that the bathing is not too cold, delightfully tonic, while thoroughly cooling. For amusement, there is golf, a putting course, two splendid tennis courts, billiards and pool, and the Tedesco and Clifton Golf Clubs are within a few minutes' ride. Here we see the hotel after the renovations, and this little girl with stockings and straw hat is enjoying the seaside. In 1917, the eight-story, quote, fireproof, quote, Puritan Hall was added to provide additional rooms. It held the children's dining room because children were only allowed into the main dining room for dessert or special occasions like their birthdays. If you had not brought your own nanny or nursemaid with you, the hotel provided one to sit with the children in their dining room and to teach them proper table manners. Puritan Hall also had a smoking room and a music room. The brochure tells us that the music was provided by members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and it says that added greatly to the attraction for the young people. Here we see some young people sitting in front of Puritan Hall, perhaps waiting to go into their own dining room. Here we have a better view of the hotel. These boys are standing just about in front of what we call the Eisman House on Puritan Lane at the beach. Uh, it was not there at this time, but at low tide you can walk over there. It was very low tide and uh, I love to see the bathing suits. Besides the hotel, there were four cottages with six to twelve rooms, each available for rent if guests wished private accommodations. There was a large garage with space on the second floor for the chauffeurs to sleep. There was a cottage for the waitresses, a cottage for the cook and crew, and a cottage for the other workers. There were not too many local people who worked there at that time because it was always a season of business. The season was from May to Labor Day. The heyday of the hotel was the early 1900s, the 20s, and the 30s. The complex filled 22 acres of land, employed 150 persons during the season, and welcomed 50,000 guests annually. The main lobby had a ballroom and movie theater, barbershop, beauty salon, health clinic, coffee shop, dentist, library, and pad room several candy shops, and several shops that had daily newspapers from all over the country extended along the lobby to the main dining room and front desk. There was also a cocktail lounge, golf shop, photography studio, and dance studio. The lower area, not open to the public, housed a bakery, a tailor, a fish market, housekeeping center, laundry, butcher shop, and print shop. The print shop printed the menus, the programs, and also published the hotel's daily paper of arrivals, departures, and events. The hotel was truly a self-contained city. an automobile showing uh, people approaching the hotel under the porte cochere, the, the entrance to the hotel. And this is looking out uh, from there, out to the beach, and look at those wonderful old cars. Uh, I'm going to quote from the brochure because I like the way they talk about the automobiles. 
This is a quote. From the earliest days of the sport, motoring has been a favorite pastime with no Ocean House guests. The roads of the North Shore are especially good for automobiling, and they are hard and smooth and run through a beautiful stretch of country where the fine natural scenery forms a background for the handsome villas of noted people in the social world. There is a large, well-appointed garage on the premises where automobiles can be cared for and stored, gasoline procured, and all ordinary repairs made. Also, cars can be hired by the hour, day, or week. There is a boarding stable connected with the hotel for the convenience of those who bring their own horses, and a fine string of saddle horses with a competent riding master adds to the many attractions. Horses and carriages may be hired with careful drivers at reasonable rates. This is a view of the lovely bathhouse from the porch. Of course, one could not possibly walk through the hotel or hotel grounds in a bathing costume. So the guests would change before and after swimming in this charming bathhouse. This is the lobby. This is probably during the 30s and 40s because of the white columns and the white wicker. The picture of the older lobby that was in the brochure was very lit or dark with orientals, dark wood, heavy Victorian furnishings. Note the elevator operator on the right, ready to take the guests to their rooms. This is a very old photo of the dining area. The waiter at the ready, and very ornate dining room chairs. I believe the table was set for so many because in those days it was important to meet and socialize with the other guests. This is another dining room. This one was in Puritan Hall and became the children's dining room. This is a bedroom, quite modest, but this is one with the private bar. You can see the bar. This is, a, this is a scene looking out from a bedroom window. This home on the left was called Peace Haven, and it was the estate of Charles H. Bond. The view of homes uh, on the point to the left, that's Puritan Lane, uh, that view stayed very much the same, uh, especially the house with the wide rolling green lawn. Uh, until just this year, that has looked exactly like that for all these many years but they've just done a big addition to the front. But I think it's amazing that this very, very old photo shows that house looking as it has looked for so many years. This is a view of the garden in front of Puritan Hall. The list of famous people that stayed at the New Ocean House is quite impressive. It includes Rudy Valley, who was one of the first popular singers of the 20s, President Calvin Coolidge, Eleanor and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, Helen Keller, Babe Ruth, Tallulah Bankhead, Sinclair Lewis, Walter Brennan, Hapo Marx, Lucille Ball, Guy Lombardo. Uh, here, Reverend Billy Graham held his first appearance as an evangelist at the hotel in 1925. And John F. Kennedy held his first major fundraiser for his campaign for senator at the hotel. And there were many, many more, too numerous to mention, famous people that stayed at the New Ocean House. This is a car stopping at the servants service, service entrance at Puritan Hall. All deliveries and services entered here. Here are the tennis courts at the back of the hotel. This is where, for many years after the hotel was gone, there was a parking lot for those heading to Wales Beach, New Ocean House Beach, or Eisman's Beach, those are the three popular names for the beaches that were in front of the New Ocean House. Each year for many years there was a national convention of women's clubs held on the grounds. Over 200 guests attended and exhibit tents would be set up on the grounds behind the hotel. Here we see many of the women walking back to the hotel after a day at the exhibits. Also, please note the four-story extension at the back of the hotel to the right, not with the white uh, triangular roof, but to the right. 
This is where, according to the newspaper accounts, the fire supposedly started. This is a view of the bathhouse. Uh, it's just a, a beautiful looking building, and that remained uh, for a long time after the, uh, the hotel was no longer. This is a view of the bathhouse on the left with people watching a croquet match. This was a croquet lawn, and it was especially set up for the game of croquet. This is the 1922 Swanscott Police Force posing in front of the New Ocean House. <laughs> Behind it, you can see a lot of the old cars. This is an aerial view of the New Ocean House. Uh, it's interesting because it shows the nine-hole par three golf course behind the hotel that extended all the way to Humphrey Street. You can also see on the right the garage and the convention hall. This is just a, an automobile coming. They took a lot of pictures of Puritan Hall. They were so proud of that building. This is just somebody coming to the New Ocean House. In, uh, this is a photo of people relaxing near the ocean, fully dressed, women with stockings and shoes and hats, except for the bathing beauty sitting on the walk. So we think that this must have been about the 30s or 40s uh, that she would be wearing that suit. But if you look at the beach, down at the beach, there's a fellow leaning against the wall in his bathing suit, and it's a costume that goes up to the shoulders. So he, he was more, he had the same type of suit that she did. <laughs> in 1937, the New Ocean House served as the White House headquarters when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's son, John, married Ann Clark in Nahant. The wedding reception was at the New Ocean House. In 1941, President Roosevelt and staff stayed at the hotel when he met with Winston Churchill off the coast to discuss the Atlantic Charter. This was quite an exciting time for the inhabitants of the town, and many went out in boats to get a closer look at history in the making. In the 40s and 50s, many local proms, banquets, and wedding receptions were held at the hotel. I'd like to read from the menu of the wedding reception of Andy and Betty Holmes. Andy and Betty were married at the New Ocean House. Uh, I'm sorry, they held their reception for their wedding at the New Ocean House in 1946. And the menu was tomato juice cocktail, rose radishes, queen olives, cream of celery de beurre, steamed Ipswich clams with drawn butter, clam bouillon, baked whitefish, boiled swampscape lobster, Delmonico potatoes, green peas, lettuce and tomato salad with French dressing, chocolate parfait, assorted cakes, and coffee. Sounds great, Betty. <laughs> Although there is no picture in this slide presentation of Colonel Clement Kennedy, no discussion of the hotel could be complete without mention of this man. He became associated with the hotel in 1915 when he took a summer job there between college semesters. He then served in the Army during World War I and returned to purchase the hotel in the 30s and to become president of it until 1959. He was instrumental in bringing the convention business to the hotel. This was an unheard of idea for a fashionable hotel. And it was such a successful scheme that it provided much of the revenue for the next four decades. Note the excedra, the white cement, half moon shaped seating area. Uh, that is the only thing now that we have left of the Ocean House in this area. Uh, it's still there but it was uh, just a pleasant place for people to sit and gaze out at the ocean. In the late 50s, the beginning of air travel and the availability of the automobile and well-constructed highways led to the decline of the grand old dame like the new ocean house. No longer were people able to vacation for an entire summer in one spot, nor did they desire to. The hotel was sold in 1961 to a group headed by Harold Rudnick of Boston. Over $100,000 worth of renovations took place, and the hotel was marketed to attract a more modern set. 
An Olympic-sized swimming pool was constructed and the bathhouse was used as a snack bar. This is a brochure from the 60s. Note that the small towers are gone and that the roof line is completely flat. The brochure, um, the, next, the next page of the brochure uh, showed that uh, the roads like the Mass Pike and Route 128, uh, how easy it was to get to Swampscott with these major highways. It also um, mentioned places to visit, side trips. You can now drive into Boston, Marblehead, I'm going to try to make that clear. You can drive into Boston, Marblehead, Rockport, Salem. So they were trying to atta attract the modern group. This is just the, uh, the cover of another brochure, but we see the flat roof and we see uh, the uh, change in the front of the building too. They were trying to attract people from, for conventions, so it uh, lists the meeting rooms and the seating capacity of each. Uh, the convention hall, 2,000. The ballroom, 1,000, and so on and so forth. The dining room, and down to the smaller rooms where they could hold smaller meetings. The brochure also advertised the Par 3 golf course and the Olympic-sized swimming pool. This is the new lobby, completely done over with green carpeting and topiary. Uh, white paint and white wick wicker furniture brightened up the lobby. To the right, you see the glass panes. Those were the entrances to the shops. There were shops all along the side. The restaurant, however, tried to recapture the elegance of a former era with heavy damask and red and gold color scheme. Uh, we take a look at the china, the dishware, because we have that on our table. We were lucky enough to bring, to be able to have some at the Humphrey House and to bring in here tonight. And I think someone brought in a plate from that set, uh, the red and gold. <laughs> Maybe somebody can help with this. This was a hat party. It was famous for, hat pot, for a hat party. Um, this must have been in the 50s, it looks like. And uh, we just thought this was a fun picture to bring. Even the men got in on it. <laughs> this is a side view uh, of the, you will see the Excedra that et cetera is still there. And this is a postcard and of the Olympic size <coughs> pool. So this was something they were definitely advertising to get people to come. However, uh, the morning of May 9th, this appeared headlines in uh, the Daily Evening Item, Fire Levels the New Ocean House, a loss estimated at 1.5 million. On Thursday evening, May 8th, 1969, one of the worst single dwelling fires in Massachusetts history destroyed the almost 80-year-old New Ocean House. Mrs. Viola Anderson of Lynn, Reservations Clerk and Assistant to the General Manager, was the only employee in the main building and called the Swampskit Fire Department at 9.53 p.m. when she smelled smoke and heard crackling to the left of the elevator opposite the front door. Three other employees were in the kitchen area, unaware of the fire, but fled the building when the fire apparatus arrived. Swampskit Fire Chief Walter Champion stated that the fire seemed to have started in the four-story extension that projects northerly in the west end of the building, sometimes called the annex. The fire quickly sped through the wooden building, and the flames consumed the hotel within minutes after the firefighters arrived. The Beverly Times reported that at about 12.45 a.m., the blaze took on the aspect of an inferno. Flames reached heights of better than 300 feet and were visible for hundreds of miles literally turning night into day. Spectators watched from the site of the hotel swimming pool and the bathhouse, but they were forced back as the tremendous heat increased. At one point, about midnight, only one stream of water was being played on the front of the building. 
The Beverly engine suctioned water from the swimming pool, and lines were run down to the beach in an attempt to draw seawater, but to no avail. Over 40 communities from as far away as Gloucester and Boston sent equipment, and as many as 200 firefighters battled the fire. The hotel had opened only the week before for a convention of 200 people, but at the time of the fire, there were no longer any guests there. Two large conventions were scheduled for the following week, and the summer season was about to begin. In 1964, the building had been sold to George Raba, who was president of the Chandler School for Women. Firefighters and equipment remained on the scene into the next day, and Fire Chief Champion rotated some of the shifts that had been on the scene all night. Several firefighters retreated for smoke inhalation. This is a, an explosion. Uh, they, they think it was a lot of the alcohol in the bar exploding. <laughs> of course, there was much speculation as to the cause of the fire, and also the inability of the many fire departments to contain the blaze. The lack of water seemed to be cause for much discussion. In an article in the Swampscott Reporter, May 15, 1969, quote, Fire Department Captain James Champion stated that there was a private contracting firm installing sewage lines along Gale Road who failed to report a broken water main to the fire department. As a result, when the firemen arrived and connected their hoses to the nearby hydrants, the water pressure was minimal. <coughs> Hundreds of feet of empty, outstretched hose lay flattened near the entrance of the hotel due to lack of water. All the water, he said, had to come from hydrants toward the fish house and from Humphrey Street. <coughs> this is the scene the day after. And we were lucky enough to get some slides, Katie Villariani let us use slides that were actually taken that night. And I'm not going to say anything. I think that they will speak for themselves. Notice the number of people that were, I think half the town was out there and it started at almost 10 o'clock at night, so this was throughout the night. And then in the paper, uh, I think this was a, a wonderful picture. This is the entrance to the New Ocean House. So just a very poignant photo. A sad farewell to an opulent air. And today, this is uh, in the place of the uh, New Ocean House. This was a bright, sunny fall day. And uh, there are three to one side of the brick building and then three of the uh, double condominiums to the other side of the brick building. So um, that's one side. And this is the other side. This is about where Puritan Hall would have been, I think. And then looking out, uh, the view is still the beautiful, beautiful view that Swampscott has of the ocean, the sky, the rocks. It's just a, a wonderful view. This is the same thing they would have seen a hundred years ago when they looked out. This is not the same thing that they would have seen because we have the uh, wonderful skyline of Boston that we now can enjoy and look out to see. Uh, but those same rocks on the right are rocks where people a hundred years ago from the Ocean House stood and looked out at the ocean. And we were lucky enough to find a poem written by uh, a person who lived in Swampscott, Lawrence Burns, and he often sent poetry into the item and to the reporter. 
and about topics in Swampscott, and he wrote a poem uh, called The Passing of the New Ocean House, and I'd like to read that uh, as we end this story of the New Ocean House. Bright memories of the moonlit nights, waves breaking on the shore, with romance dancing through the rooms and gliding o'er the floors, the many resting from their work and basking in the sun, then in the sea for one more swim before the day was done. An eerie voice calls out the role of once important names, while ghosts of all that once had been would sadly watch the flames. An era ends, the gracious life may be more gracious yet, but as new ways replace the old, there are some who won't forget. And thank you for coming this evening to remember our new ocean This um, presentation is a short movie, but what happened was, a uh, little bit of history, everybody's talking about history this evening. Um, I've spent 60 years plus and minus in the Swamp Scott, my folks live up on um, Forest Avenue down here by the Puritan Road area, and one of my hobbies was ham radio. And, um, Somehow I got involved with Ernie Coons and Lynn and a few other people, and we started what they call Ham Fests, which is a convention of radio heads. And one or two years, we ended up with the world's largest convention, right here at the New Ocean House. Um, this was 1969, and in two weeks, uh, I was expecting 3,000 people to show up. We had exhibitors from all over the country coming, we had our tickets all sold, and um, I was home probably watching TV in the phone rang, and my ticket chairman was a Revere fireman. And the firemen always have their two-way radios on. They listen to all the calls. But Art Tomkinson from Revere, maybe a few of you know him, he's still, he's still living, uh, <coughs> he tended to be a little bit of a wise guy. So he called up and he said, Gene, the new ocean house is on fire, get down there. Oh, how, how are you, Art? Um, how are the tickets going? <laughs> yeah, but I need it! <laughs> so I took my Bolex camera and cut some film out of the freezer and drove down to the new ocean house. And I parked very easily on the main street, there was nobody around. And I walked down the driveway to the the pool area, and I met a couple of people. Bob Brest, remember Bob? He was there. He lived down the street. He was, he was, he was around the couple to look at it. I said, where's this big fire they're talking about? Oh, well, it's not really a big fire. Uh, look up at the top of the hotel. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and see that little tiny orange glow up at the very top? I said, yep, that's the fire. <laughs> and somebody else mentioned next to me, don't forget. This hotel is covered with aluminum siding. Things are happening in there. And by then, the fire department had discovered no water in the, in the hydrant. And things were getting a little bit nervous. A couple of things I did not like to see, I saw. People started coming, and they were stealing all the liquor out of the bar and running out of the bar. <laughs> Another thing I didn't like to see was that the Owners of the hotel didn't have anyone save anything. All that beautiful furniture, those gorgeous chandeliers, all those things, they left them there. They just abandoned the place and let it burn. And that was very sad. So what you're going to see are just a few pictures I took from the outside. And what about those three to 4,000 people that were coming? And someone asked me, aren't you worried? No, I already had a plan. And I'll tell you about that as the film goes on. So I'm afraid we can't get it too dark in here, and this is not going to show up too brightly, but I think you'll be able to see something. And hopefully, uh, you'll be able to see a little bit of what I saw.
there's a little tiny, tiny light. Just beginning to glow, and you can see the flashing lights of the fire department. Now it's getting a little, little stronger. The flames are starting to get a little high. This is the extreme left-hand area of the hotel. There's the smoke. You see a little bit of that coming in. Now it's getting a little bigger. And you're beginning to see a little bit of the action. Little things happening. Now, why wasn't I concerned about the uh, convention? Well, of course I was concerned. I'm the general chairman. <laughs> But I knew there was a saleswoman that had been chasing me for several years from the establishment in Boston. And I knew where I lived in Marblehead. And the next morning at quarter seven, I called him on the phone. Oh, oh, oh. I said, hi, this is Gene Hastings, you know, the radio convention. Oh, yeah, and now I'm getting him away a little bit. I said, I was thinking of having the convention at your hotel, after all. <laughs> oh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. When do you want it? I said, in two weeks. Two weeks! I said, yeah, the ocean house burned to the ground last night. <laughs> there is the one of two fire hoses you see. You can imagine what good they did against the rule of sighting. He said, I'll call you back this morning if I can. So I went to work. I worked with an item. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, he called me back and he said, I have moved out five conferences to five other hotels. You have the entire hotel. We had the convention on the advertised dates. We had thousands of people come. And we were just very, very fortunate. The hotel helped us. I said, you all, I owe you. We're going to have the convention at your hotel next year, too. He thanked me for that. And the television stations, four, five, and seven, they loved and excuse to run these fire pictures. And they kept running the publicity all week and telling everybody where the, whole, where the convention was going to be. And of course, radio hands got on the radio. So by the end of that, we'll go home the front. See how the standing held it together? And so everybody knew the convention had been moved and they all came in town and had a great time. And we were just very fortunate. But we did miss the devotion now. People liked the informality. And they like to walk around and just have a good time. But it was not to be. There's a little, little tiny stream of water, you can see it. Now this is the porch. This is the front porch. The portico is starting to go. And the, and the fire is moving toward the center of the building. And that's the entrance way. You're going to register for, at the hotel. That's getting in flames now. And it's really starting to get serious stuff. And they can imagine the heat coming out of there or something like to comment already. There, the whole front just came in. The entire front went at one time. It's nothing but cinders. Tremendous flame. And guess what happened to their fireproof building they were so proud of? That's next door to the right. Now the flames are licking the fireproof building and look, and now the next day. That's all that's left at the time. That was a pine tree. That was a fir tree that was standing up. There's a power plant. There's a dining hall. And the power plant behind it. The so-called fireproof building. And all the water that was played on the hotel to try to put it out from the various hoses. And that's the picture. Now where's that hose? Thank you. Here she comes. Oh, you've got a comment. Okay. The next day he said, I ruined my tripod. 
on the, with the sand that, that on, on the beach got into the legs of his striped line. It was very upsetting to him. Well, Gene was telling me today on the phone that a lot of the uh, fire departments had sand in the hoses of the, is that the yes, seawater? Yes, they put in some of the bumpers, right. Right, and they had the seawater and they were ruined, so they had to be replaced. Uh, I also read that uh, there were so many people, because the fire could be seen from such a distance, people came from other towns and created a traffic jam so the fire apparatus couldn't get in very well because there were so many people coming to see the fire. Anybody else? I like your Apple store. He lived up on the hill next to the, uh, what's the big estate up there? From the, uh, next to the trial, Ocean View Road. His mother didn't wake him up to see it, so she, she's afraid he'd be late to work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, uh, how many of us were there? Understand? I mean, think of it, starting at 10 o'clock at night, and there were people that stayed there throughout the whole evening, just, uh, just mesmerized. Um, yes? I grew up on Lincoln House Point. Can you talk about all the fire engines? We didn't hear a thing. Walter Dropo called us from Marblehead. He was driving home and woke us up. And then I woke up, everybody but the Canes, because they had seven little kids. And they were so mad, they slept through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Hi, I'm Frank Bates, and I'm from Dawn, and I was at my parents' house that night. My dad had retired two weeks previous, still had the tapper. The tapper went off and said, it's new over there. Let's go. Jumped in my car. I parked right near Smith Lake. And I looked who's my car. I think it was burned up. We stayed there. My mother and my father. My, my father was going in and my mother was yelling at him, Frank, Frank, you're retired. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> so anyway, we didn't see much going on in the front. And my father came out and said, go out back. That's when we saw it. So I took my car back. <laughs> Yeah. Went back down, and I remember my mother and I walked home at, to the park in that way, and we were completely disoriented from all the smoke out there. Then I went back, I stayed till about 2 o'clock in the morning. They said they were hosing down a lot of the houses in the area. Uh, what did Gene read? He's telling me that. Yeah. They, they, they hosed down, um, I live on Glen Road, which is down near City. And I had to go to school the next morning. It was a junior high school. And I was trying to get to sleep, and I hear this water running in. And I'm going, what is going on? I look out my, my bedroom window, and there's a fire truck closing down my, my roof and all the, the neighbors. It was working, but we didn't have the direction. There wouldn't be any firemen here tonight who were at that uh, blaze. Is there anybody? suspicion of arson? I don't know the answer to that, but I never, in all of my research, I didn't hear anything. I yes? can honestly tell you, the lady that lived downstairs in my house, worked there, she was told that morning not to report to work. Anybody else have any stories about the Ocean House? How many people went to a prom there? 
hotel administration. Well, uh, and Betty, and where is that paper that about Kevin Kennedy uh, talked about his handkerchiefs being? Uh, oh, that he always wore a shirt, a tie, and a jacket. It could be 95 degrees, and you would never take off that jacket. That's right. It yes. always was called Colonel Kennedy. Colonel Kennedy. Betty, you might have this was from a history session at the Swampscott Library with Lou Gallup. Lyndon Ellis, now in his 70s, told the history group that he had uh, bought a cleaner's delivery room for $5 from another kid when he was a senior in high school. Part of his room included deliveries to the New Ocean House where he got his best tips. When he delivered cleaning to Clem Kennedy, owner of the hotel, Mr. Kennedy would empty all his pockets of change onto the table and then scoop up all the change from the table and give it to, the, to Lyndon for a tip. Lyndon said he soon learned to do the Kennedy delivery from Shanconi's cleaners and tailoring shop on Thursdays when Mr. Kennedy was sure to have the most change in his pocket. <laughs> Kennedy's handkerchiefs were sent to the cleaners, and they were ironed and then folded and pressed with the heavy steamer. This is Shane Cone, then wrapped and tied the handkerchiefs with brown paper and string, and the handkerchiefs were returned with Mr. Kennedy's other cleaning. Mr. Kennedy always dressed in a suit with a fresh handkerchief in the pocket. He certainly never draped his jacket over the back of the chair when he was home. His jacket was always hung up in the closet. If he had his jacket off and in the closet and his doorbell rang, he would be sure to put on his jacket before he opened the door. When Mr. Kennedy ate his breakfast, even if dining alone, he would have the proper table setting, complete with knife holder. He was neat and precise in everything he did. That was from uh, the library. It's on Friday, by the way, first Friday of every month, they have meetings at the library where people discuss the history of the town. It's a great thing to, uh, to do. Yes? I wouldn't have said this, but now that you brought up those pieces, when I went in to saw Clem Kennedy about having the convention that he knew me for the Irish, and he said, well, I like the business, Gene, but do your guys drink? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, water, maybe. Well, I'll give you a chance, but if we find them like the American Legion conventions, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> After the first convention was over, and this is a program from that 1959 when I had the New Ocean House on the cover of our program. He came up to me and he said, I don't have to worry about you, you can come anytime you want. To. <laughs> yes, he always was the first one to pay his taxes in Swansea. When the taxes were due, he would be the first one in line down the town hall to pay his taxes. And it was the largest tax.